This year's conference is testament to our sector's collective ability to find a way to come together, to share our experiences and to explore significant matters which are close to all of our hearts. I hope you've been able to get a sense of the exciting and vibrant discussions that have taken place so far. It's fair to say that the last 18 months, the heritage and cultural sectors have undergone a great period of change. We've had to adapt to a rapidly changing world, reiterating the importance of our collections and our professions, while navigating challenging debates about the way that history is presented across the UK and around the globe. I'm therefore honored to be able to introduce our keynote speakers whose perspectives on these conversations and the work that they do to address issues such as this are highly respected. Like the other keynotes and sessions over the course of the next few days, both of the talks promise to be fascinating contribution to this year's DC DC theme. And I'm sure like me, that you're looking forward to hearing their honest and robust reflections on the significant impact that the pandemic has had on heritage, on culture, information and academic organizations, as well as their perspectives on global conversations surrounding history and the memorialization. After our keynote speakers have presented their thoughts, I'm gonna be chairing an open discussion, including questions from the audience. So if you do have a question or a comment for Olivette and John, then please post them in the Q&A function that you can see at the bottom of the screen. So I'm honored to introduce our first keynote speaker, Olivette Atelli. Olivette is Professor of History of Slavery and Memory of Enslavement at the University of Bristol and a fellow and a vice president of the Royal Historical Society. Her areas of research are colonial and post-colonial history and the histories of people of African descent. She's a trustee of the Research Committee at the VNA and an ambassador for the National Archives Trust. She's also Bristol's mayoral chair for the Commission on Racial Equality. Her most recent monograph, African European and Untold History was published last year. Olivet's talk will explore the challenges surrounding debates on colonial histories and memorialization and how history is written and discussed today. So, Olivet, over to you. Thank you very much, um, Jeff. Um, I'm delighted to be here today. Um, so, let's dive straight in. So, last year, with the toppling of the statue of slave trader Edward Colston, many in Britain uh, came to the realization that there was a debate about the legacies of Britain's colonial past and the way certain forms of remembrance influence our gaze on our identities. What appeared to be clear was the fact that there was an emotional content, to say the least, um, attached to, to, to these debates. Between those who wanted to tear the statues down and those who argued that history would then be lost if people toppled them, there seemed to be little room for actually examining what public memorialization means or meant. Statues are there to commemorate, celebrate, and in any case, they mark the urban and rural landscape in order to evidence an event and to memorialize a particular story. Memorialization is cultural, political, and of course social, a social sealant or social cement. It is about, um, it is also about power and those who get or got to tell the story that is deemed relevant to the majority, whether that majority sees it as indeed relevant or not, is only part of the motives. What also appears to be incredibly interesting to observe was the idea that debates about statues related to slavery were echoing what was happening in the US with controversies around the Confederate flags, statues, and with the toppling of the statue of colonizer Cecil Rhodes in South Africa. So it was about echoing what was happening um, uh, in relation to the events of 2014, 2015. Never mind that actually, some 30 years prior to these debates, in 1991, the statue of Josephine de Beauharnais, um, who was Napoleon's wife, and that was commissioned by Napoleon III, who was the nephew of Bonaparte, 
1859 was decapitated in Martinique, one of France's overseas territories in the Caribbean. So 1991. And the symbolism of such an act is incredible. Activists didn't want to topple the statue, but wanted to engage in a fierce discussion about the idea of partial truth, partial history and memory, partial amnesia of the French state over the history of enslavement. Over the years, the debates evolved and Josephine's statue could not be complete and the head could not be restored until France had engaged with the question of reparations. In July 2020, the statue was eventually toppled. So the toppling of those memorials is not only about how history was bound to be lost if we removed statues, but also about the disappearance of particular reading of that history and what that history says about the society or the community or the governments that erected it at the time. Another point of interest that was rarely debated in the English speaking world is the role of statues of abolitionists in urban and rural landscapes, mostly urban landscapes, and what these statues teach us about the history of enslavement. In Martinique and French Guyana, activists attacked the statue of Victor Schulcher, who is the equivalent of uh, uh, William Wilberforce, actually. And why do they do that? Many reasons. One of these reasons is because white saviorism has a legacy and an impact on our contemporary societies as much as slavery. So these debates and controversies go beyond the dichotomy between history and memory of enslavement. It is about the rewriting of a representation of a history that until then had been seen as satisfying by the majority of people. Of course, one can argue that in a democracy, the majority has the right to decide who should feature in our urban landscapes, in our public realm. And that doesn't quite work uh, that way actually, especially when it comes to colonial history. Let me give you an example. Colson, for instance, was not particularly celebrated by the vast majority of people in Bristol in the 19th century. His statue was erected 175 years after his death by a small group of wealthy men, merchants, whose families have been plantation owners and slave traders. They decided to pay homage to a man who wasn't particularly attached to the city either, as he was not living there anymore when actually when he died. So what is this all about? Well, there are several answers to the question, but I want to throw something out in the debate, which is the impact of the pandemic in all this. Why? Because quite often the threat of imminent death can bring communities together, exacerbate what has already been brewing or both. The pandemic brought to the surface the cracks that exist within British society, especially when it comes to the representation of the history of enslavement and colonialism on one hand, and the absence or links made between that history and its legacies on the other. So, in the middle of the pandemic, we have a fear of losing spatial markers that have been seen as part of our national identity or identities. And on the other hand, those statues are seen as the last true in a time of suffering increased by pre existing social and racial inequalities. These statues are deemed obscene by some reminders, obscene reminders of unshared wealth and racial inequality. The debates are, of course, also about the political climate and uses of those controversies to score points at political levels. Yes, history, memory, and politics are often intertwined. And when it comes to colonial history, I'm actually arguing that they cannot be separated. Well, I have been arguing that since uh, my, my PhD in 2005, and I defended it at La Sorbonne, and it created quite a stir because you don't bring history and memory together and let alone add politics in the mist. So what is the role of the historian in all of this? How do we work with a material that is sometimes elusive, subject to contradictory interpretations or political, politically charged? The answer is not simple, but we could argue that, well, our job is not to put a judgment on these things, but to critically analyze, analyze them using evidence. But as many of you know, historians do not live outside their own society and communities. Their role, however, is to try and analyze the various aspects of, our, of one history or one story, and to be brave enough to question the validity of their own findings 
or previous, inter previous interpretations. History is about the rewriting of history, contrary to what Oliver Dowden and others have said. There is, however, danger in focusing only on the emotional content and the political agenda of various groups. Now, how do we engage with these debates while retaining a perspective that allows us to see the bigger picture? Well, it's not easy either, but all of these controversies do tell us something, that there is much more to the story. In fact, the unease could be a sign of shifting mentalities and priorities. Embracing those controversies means going further than our feelings and even further than the basic dichotomy to topple or not. It could be about a particular production of knowledge and how that is being challenged. And I would like to conclude on a few points. We as historians have a long time been deemed guardians of the past because we have helped shape some of these discourses that are now being contested. We have to accept the criticism. The bigger debate behind statue walls is about knowledge production and it worries many in my profession because it is outside academia and it is about what is deemed non-scholarly activism. Well, this is where our ability to embrace multiple perspectives is useful. Are we really the only ones able to create historical knowledge? Well, the answer is simple. And the answer that I want to give as a minority ethnic woman living in a global north is no, we're not the only one. I came to history because of the fascination I had for a woman who could tell stories, colonial stories, in a way that was vibrant, engaging, accurate, and respectful to all of those involved, including the British, the German, the French colonizers. That woman was my grandmother, whose great-grandmother and mother's history had been shared from one generation to the next one, orally. So my point here, here is that we need to look at who gets to tell the story, how these stories are told, what it says about these people's memories and how those stories shift or enrich our interpretations of the material that are contained in various national and local archives. So it is also about the way new approaches encourage people to share their own archival material and histories with us and what we make of those stories and those material. It's about the new tools and new approaches that are required to read, understand, analyze, transmit and teach those histories to a greater number of people. That is one of the reasons why I wanted to engage with the National Archive Trust and the reason why I work with the British Empire and Commonwealth Collection in Bristol. My very last point is that history is transmitted from generation to generation. So are specific tools to produce and present knowledge. So are trauma related to the oppressive nature of certain historical narratives. Yes, just as much as there, are such a, there is such a thing as the post memory as defined by Marianne Hirsch, meaning memory and trauma transmitted from one generation to another, there is such a thing as intergenerational sense of entitlement that is not related to the amount of money one has, but that is related to the pride one has about certain ancestral achievements in one's place in the world. In certain cases, it becomes really difficult to challenge one's own perceptions and belief systems. And quite often what challenges us is dramatic events, changes such as COVID-19, George Floyd's death, the toppling of a statue, and a debate about whose history matters. Our ability to accept that those debates and controversies are actually opening the door to opportunities to think beyond, beyond our individual, communal, and national historical boundaries will determine the way we do history, the way we envisage interconnectedness, and the way we engage with various source material, and most probably, the way we look at other areas from the history of climate change, epidemics, to racial, gender, and social justice. Thank you. Thanks, Oliver. Uh, next up, I'm delighted to introduce our second keynote speaker. John Orner Ornstein is Director of Culture and Engagement at the National Trust. He's responsible for leading the organization's care for and programming of its historic places. 
He was formerly director of Museums for Arts Council England uh, and head of London and national programs for the British Museum, where he started his career as a curator of Roman coins. John's talk will explore how 2020 was a year of challenge that has led inevitably to change, including harnessing the power of history, beauty and nature to bring people together. Over to you, John. Thank you very much indeed, um, Jeff. And I suppose that as Olivet was speaking, I was reflecting on just how different our talks were, but I think that will be helpful in terms of this session and particularly in terms of the session that, uh, that the conversation that follows. And what I have to say is less about um, a sort of uh, a philosoph philosophical position and the, um, uh, the, the sort of foundations for the thinking about how we approach history as a sector. And it's more reflection on practical experience and uh, and a year of turbulence, to be honest, and how how we've responded as an organisation and um, perhaps how we could respond together as cultural organisations. Um, let, let me start with a with a phrase. And the National Trust looks in two directions. One is towards the, the countryside and nature and the outdoors, um, and the other is towards um, houses and collections and museums and archives and so on. Um, and looking towards the countryside, there is old country saying that thorn is the mother of the oak which I think is a beautiful saying and what that refers to really is that you need the scrubby undergrowth you need the thorns to protect the saplings to protect the young oaks and it's it's out of those thorns and only out of those thorns that, uh, that the strong oak grows. So this has been a year of massive challenge for all of us, hasn't it? And it certainly has for the National Trust. And I think I think that's organisationally. And I think it's important to acknowledge that that's individually as well. Um, at the National Trust, we, uh, we, we our income uh, over the last year has been down £219 million. Um, and that scale of income change has, has meant that we could only respond in one way, and that's by reorganising the whole of the National Trust. Um, and in the end, that has led to about 1,700 job losses, um, so massive implications for people's individual lives. Um, al alongside that, um, that uh, a process like that is that is never easy, but it's come with a with a whole set of other factors and and to some extent of external commentary, and quite a bit of that has been about accusations of dumbing down and not valuing expertise, and that's something else that we've seen uh, levelled at other organisations where they've made um, changes in their staffing, um, and actually some of that comes uh, to be quite honest within the cultural sector, let alone from out, out, outside the cultural sector, and um, very very. Um, happy to answer questions about that um, in a few minutes time. Alongside that though, and, and linked to what Olivetta has, has been talking about, um, the Trust back in September produced a report on the links between uh, the historic places that we look after and colonialism and specifically um, slavery. Um, the response to that was very significant. There have been more than 300 press pieces across the world and counting all the time every weekend. Um, there were three parliamentary debates about whether we were conducting ourselves in a way that was appropriate. And there was a charity commission report that took a look at the National Trust um, and decided fortunately that we acted completely within our charitable purpose in producing that report. Um, the impact of all of those things on the organisation has been enormous. And as I say, it's not it, it's, jo it's the job losses, it's the constant change that many of us have experienced in our personal and professional lives. Um, but on top of that, whole, whole other layers of, um, to be honest, of, of racism and abuse and even death threats directed towards um, myself and colleagues. So a, a really challenging context. My reflection is that uh, as a result of all of that, and it's, this is when we begin to talk, think about the, um, the thorn and the oak, I think we're in a stronger place than we were a couple of years ago pre-pandemic. Um, we are better set up, I think, to care for the places that we uh, look after, that we're responsible for, and we're much clearer about what our approach is to history. Um, a, a few examples, um, we've, we've gathered and focused our resource. For example, we have, um, we've categorised 28 of our houses as treasure 
treasure houses, the, the most houses with, with the most significant collections and histories. And we're focusing resource on those places. So each one of those, for example, has its own curator. And, and our ambition is that each one of those is a significant cultural center. Um, at the opposite end of the extreme, we've gathered together about 70 of our properties that are small properties. And these are the wonderful homes of authors and scientists and musicians and so on um, and uh, and each of those um, are individually brilliant and and the we've taken the opportunity to, to operate them in a different way, to run a different model for those properties, but actually to accentuate what's important about them, to make them more immersive, more about the particular individual histories of the places. We've got much clearer what we think about history and, you know, put at its simplest, we believe our role is to research and interpret the whole history of our places in our care. And we're unambiguous about that, despite the challenge that we've received. Um, just as importantly, and I, I think um, the, towards the end, um, Olivet was 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 moving towards this. We we believe that despite all of the um, all of the challenge of the last year, that history and heritage can be a unifying force rather than rather than a dividing one. And and, and again, I'm interested to talk more about that. In very practical terms, um, we think we can do better in terms of how we interpret and present our sites. So that that report that I mentioned on colonial uh, links to colonialism and slavery was just a, a very ordinary document document to be quite to be quite honest, no more than a, a, a sort of simple account of the history of some of those places and some some essays that um, that, that linked them. It, in itself, it's not that significant. What's much more significant is how we tell the whole history of our places. So we're going to we're going to be working on improving interpretation in the first place at around forty of our sites across the National Trust, and that will be telling histories of um, you know histories of architecture or whatever it happens to be um, just ju just as much as it's explored some of the histories that this session will focus on. We're also absolutely determined to continue to be for everyone and actually to be to be more for everyone um, than we have been in the past. So we've take, we've done some lovely practical things over the past year. For example, we've developed a new um, a new uh, blossom park at the Olympic Park in East London um, with 33 trees represent each one representing a borough of London um, and linked to COVID and loss through COVID. Just a really practical, tangible, lovely thing to do with those communities. We plan to work with 10 other cities over the last year, over the next year to do the same thing and, and to plant in, in all 4 million blossoming trees as symbols of hope. We're also working in different ways and, I, and I, again I think this relates to what Olivier was saying about how we do history, how we explore history um, and, and our focus as we've reorganised ourselves is much more on partnership than it has been in the past, much more on crowdsourcing for example and less on what we do ourselves, more on how we work with others and how we conduct ourselves. And we've done some other lovely practical things like um, developing hubs for children and young people in 20 25 national properties across the country. So um, I, I suppose what, where, where is all of that going? Um, what am I trying to say? That at a time of massive challenge, I, I think there is only one sort of lesson, one key lesson that we've learned and that we keep coming back to. And that's that through all of that, we've been absolutely focused on what our North Star is. And, and we, have a, we have a very simple purpose as an organization. It's to care for, for places and collections, but we do that for one reason. And that's, that's for people, that's to make people's lives better. So that, that sort of North Star of what we call everyone welcome, but you might call um, inclusion, um, um, it, it is, is the thing that, we, that I have focused on in everything, in, in all of my actions, in all of the challenge, as I support my teams, as we produce that report, as we reorganized ourselves, as we opened again, uh, it, it is that ambition to be more for everyone that, uh, that has been our North Star. Um, it's taken every bit of our stamina and energy to, to hold on to that, but it is having that North Star that's, that's made all of the difference. Just one more thought, um, which, which is this. Um, if, we, if we didn't have the challenge, if we didn't have the debate, if we didn't have the disagreement, then I, I don't think we'd be doing our jobs. I'm excited, to be honest, exhausted by, but excited by the challenge that, that, that we've had and that we continue to have and will have um, long into the future in terms of the debates that we're having. Um, and it, it seems to me that in, 
at times our cultural sector, whether you know museums, log, uh, um, archives, libraries, arts organisations, we can have quite a narrow focus and often we can serve quite a narrow constituency and I'm really interested by the fact that this 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 debate is even with you know it's with it's not from outside the National Trust it's within our own membership um, and then externally amplified externally as well of course I love the fact that we have more than five million members and all of them have a voice and all, all, all and some of them are concerned and some of them are delighted and and, and it's it's in that it's in that um, debate it's in that disagreement that I think Think we're going to find a way forward in the end. So it is that you know it, it is that breadth of constituency, that breadth of audience that I think excites me when I think about us as cultural organisations. And 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 that, you know if that's the case for the National Trust, then my goodness, it's it's the case for 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 some of your work when you work in in, in libraries and archives and so on that really do appeal to, to significantly broad constituencies. Um, I think it's only us working together that is going to make a difference. In all of this that's the thing I'm really interested in um, I think individually we uh, we can do good work I'm very very interested in what we can do between our organizations to demonstrate it what it means for history to be a unifying force thank you thanks John thanks Olivet um, I think if both of you can have your your um, cameras on that would be great uh, we're going to open it up now for um, conversations around both your talks. Excited and exhausted, I think, is probably a phrase that many of us will will connect with. Um, John, I noticed on your um, abstract that you, you finished it by saying a decade of change in a single year. I thought that was a really good way of describing the last sort of year to 18 months. And I guess I'm interested in from hearing from both of you about whether there was anything in particular, whether there was any moment in of the last 18 months that's made you think that, you know, things are going to change, that there's going to be, there's, that you could detect a shift and a, and a perception of how things might be different. So perhaps, Olivet, I, I start with you and then we'll ask, we'll give John just a little bit of a breather since he went second. So. Well, uh, yes, th there was this moment when, um, after the, the killing of George Floyd, where there was this spontaneous movement. More importantly, what I observed was through my students, I mean, I have been working on uh, popular protest and, and demonstration related to the past and all that. And suddenly you have this massive amount of young people who most of them coming from rather privileged backgrounds, most of them having no direct connection as in descent of enslaved, not at all, but completely immersed in this idea of social justice and protest and rewriting history and questioning, actually challenging the kind of history that we my generation has been teaching. And I think that's for me what a moment where I just stopped and paused and think, wow, these, these people are, are teaching me. This is a great lesson. So how do we move and how do we take it uh, from, from there? And, and going back to what you were saying earlier, Oliver, do you think, to what extent do you think that might have happened in the environment that where we didn't have COVID? Do you think that was that was something that would have happened anyway, or, or was the, you know, was the intensity, the emotion of it uh, different as a consequence of the pandemic? I'm convinced that the pandemic played a huge role because we were then facing, you know, we had, some of us had a bit more time uh, with ourselves at homes and questioning, and then the fears about, um, well, our, our health and our loved one not seeing them. And actually going on a, a kind of philosophical, uh, a, a journey, uh, most of us uh, um, played a, a huge role. But in terms of young people, it's, it was also the lack of connections and the lack of, um, you know, uh, uh, um, uh, kind of a proximity to others played a huge role because we talk about mental health, but, but this idea of not being able to express oneself actually played a huge role. And the it crystallized it in that movement uh, about a rejection of a particular kind of, uh, of reading of history and and um, and the history of police brutality and all, all the rest of it. Yeah. John, same, same question for you, if I may. Anything in particular that kind of crystallized things for you over the last 18 months or so? Um, ch change is difficult, isn't it? And change is, is slow. And I, I think most of us... Um, deal best with change when it's when it's forced on us and you and you don't have any any choice well, one of the interesting things for me caring for so many um special historic places 
it, it is is that in my mind change is very diff is very um, important for those places. So the, the thing about the places that National Trust cares for, and, and you know many of the people um, listening to this talk will 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 be in the same position, is that is that they've always evolved, they've always changed, and then there's this idea somehow that as they come into the um, in, in, into the care of an organisation like the National Trust, they should stop changing. And what that means in the end is stopping responding to people, and in the end that will mean. Um, uh, stop, stopping being stopping being relevant. So, um, I think that's sort of been exploded a little bit over the last year, and I think that is it's that that um, it's that that's an, a, a sort of wonderful opportunity. But it's that that's also a, a huge threat to people because there's, there, there is something very important in what people hold on to from the past. So, um, I, I suppose what what we've seen we, we've we've had to change, but also we've seen that people want different things over the last year. So in very simple terms, for example, people have wanted massive access to, to countryside spaces, near to peri-urban countryside spaces. Um, and, and that's something that we've been able to provide, but perhaps we haven't focused on much in the past. So there are some obvious, you know, just some obvious things that are absolutely gonna, gonna force change there. And I think it's the same with the debate um, that, that's, that's gone on. We wouldn't have entered into this debate I'll be honest, we wouldn't have chosen to enter in, into this debate in quite the way we have. Now, you might think, well, you always knew that it was going to come if you produced a report like the one you did. And I, to, only to some extent is that true. But but uh, the, 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 um, the scale of the debate um, and, and at times the ferocity of the debate has surprised us. So we certainly wouldn't have wouldn't have chosen that. So I, I suppose um, I suppose those couple of very practical moments, just seeing that people want to use our places differently. Um, in a practical sense, but also the, the the ferocity of that debate, I think, showed me that things have changed. The world has changed. Certainly, it's changed for us, and 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 it, it won't change back. To stick with you for a second, John. I, I guess I'm interested to um, hear about your thoughts about how you kind of how do you continue to make your existing visitors feel valued, but at the same time opening up your places and and the areas that you're responsible to to new audiences how do you kind of strike that balance particularly when you know there may be very different views about what the national trust is for yeah that's a that's a great question it's one i sort of wrestle with all all the time i mean i think i think the answer is that um we we are in a wonderful position where we don't have to be all things to everyone everywhere so we the, the trust cares for 500 places and 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 um there are different opportunities in all of those places and within each of our places there are different opportunities so we're already very used to the idea 10 years ago the national trust proactively went out of its way to be more open and accessible to families and and we've done that by making some of our places more accessible and some of some of them focus in particular on families and then within a particular property um we we you, you might know it or you might not know it but on the whole we tend to send kids and the families one way way and we tend to send send other people a, a, another way and if you want to make you know if you want to go where the kids are and you haven't got kids it's okay but but actually that's sort of the way it's, it it works so um i think it's not that we can keep everybody happy but it's that we can provide wonderful things we can provide the things that that people want um you know in 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 lots and lots of different places um i i think the really tricky thing if i'm honest is that philosophically that's sort of not where I want to get to because I want to bring people together in the end. I, you know, I want the opportunities for people to come together in a garden and understand that or, or in a house and understand the history of that and discuss and debate it. And I think it I think that's the fascinating thing. And I've um I think I said this to you before, Jeff, that is that that's the bit I would love if any of the people listening have examples of where they've managed to bring people with very different views and different life experiences together um, to talk about some of those things. Because I, I really do believe I, I, um, yeah, I used to work in, in, in museum museums rather than the National Trust. And I've seen again and again the power that objects have where people from very different perspectives come together around a single object and maybe, you know, through, you know, creative exploration or whatever. Um, come to some sort of a shared understanding if not if not to full agreement about the significance of that object so I know it can happen but how to do that at scale is a thing I'm really interested in. Great so I've seen that we're starting to get some questions in so I'm going to uh, try to segue to those. Oliver I was just I was thinking about you know the, the last year or so in many respects most of us have been starved of access you know access to historic houses but also to archives to libraries 
And you talk about, you know, reevaluating our approaches to how we access, produce and share knowledge. And I'm just wondering if you want to pick up on that theme a little bit and talk about how we might have to do things differently. And also, you know, the extent to which that's already changed over the last couple of decades. Yes, um, that's interesting. Yeah, very interesting one, because uh, in 2016, I visited one of the National Archive Trust, uh, the, one of the um, National Trust's um, places, and the experience was such that I actually wrote a, a chapter about it. And uh, the book just, just came out right after the report was written. Um, but it, it wasn't good. It wasn't good at all. And my, my point of view was that um, it, the, the diversifying lacked, the diversifying in terms of inclusion of several histories in one place and all that acknowledged that it, it was very difficult to do. So I have seen the, the changes in certain places and I have seen the ways in which the, the, the trust, way before I, you know, my, my paper was out, the trust has been incorporating, and I'm talking about Wales here, incorporating um, various histories and, and how incredibly difficult it's to balance several histories. In Wales, you have the history, uh, well, the history of Wales, the history of colonial history, as of the history of Wales, the, the history of, of, of work, the working class. And in that particular place, it was really a very difficult act to do. Um, but so I leave that to the National Trust to, <laughs> to deal with, but in terms of um, the uh, access to archival material, I have seen extraordinary things being done in recent years, which is, um, as I mentioned, wanted to be involved with the National Archive Trust, because it's a way, ways in which we either go to national, to queue, examine material, and the, the, the wealth material that is there and available that people are not aware of, but also the way the, uh, in the ways in which there's a, a constant dialogue between archival material, because you will find some stories at a local level, Bristol, Newport, wherever, and some of the stories are not complete simply because those archives are not talking to each other. So how do we do? Sometimes the, the fact that they're not talking to each other is because we have that missing link, and the missing link is the people who have been telling those stories. And at the local level, quite often, we found people who can transmit certain kind of knowledge that is supported by archival material, but they don't even know that and vice versa. So I think we have a huge opportunity to, to do this. And it's, it has been done as, as in many places and it's starting to be a, a, a kind of a, a way to do things, to, to bring up um, not just a story from the, the top or a story from the bottoms, but really multidimensional uh, uh, ways of doing history and the tools to read that history. It's, it doesn't have to be academic history to be serious. It has to be honest, vibrant, beautiful history. And I think we, 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 we're starting, we started to see that. And, and how much do you think that one of the questions from our audience is, uh, Oliver, about you know, post-colonial history and how much that's moved on over the last 20 years? You know, the, the question, I guess, is how much of it, how, how mainstream has that become versus how much in the margins it used to be? And do you, well, do you it, think that, do you think, sorry, and just to add to that, do you, what role do you think that archives have in, in kind of helping to, um, you know, uncover some of these histories perhaps? Okay, so I have two hats. I'm a historian and I'm a memory scholar. When it comes to memory, memory studies, memory studies have incorporated sociology, literature, and post-colonial literature and theories have been at the forefront of all these debates. I'm, I'm almost tempted to say it's already happened over there and historians didn't necessarily catch up. Uh, progress in history was so ever so slow that the dichotomy and things that we're seeing nowadays is that we, we, we're fighting to, to pass that small hurdle, which is about having a broader understanding of what history actually is. It's multi-disciplinary. Uh, and um, I think progress is being done in, one in certain disciplines, but not so much in others, but you know, eventually we get there. Yeah, that's uh, really good. Thank you. Um, just some other questions that are coming through. John, um, just thinking about uh, re-examining stories. Um, so there's a question here about um, re-examining stories uh, about cultivated natural landscapes in the light of, of colonial history, and but also other topics, things like climate change and biodiversity. Again, and just I guess that, you know this point about you know that the, the a decade of change, you know, the, the National Trust is, is having to reinvent itself across a whole range of issues, isn't it? 
Um, yeah, and 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 so it's in relation to that one specifically. I mean, to be to be very clear, the um, we need to think differently about all, all of those histories. And again, that's the wonder of the trust that it's it, it is the landscapes. It's the um, it's it's the Lake District and Snowdonia and the Brecon Beacons where I was a couple of weeks ago in the rain, etc. That um that, that that are that, that are the marvel of what we care for, and that's sort of intertwined with the um, with the histo his purely historical properties if you want to see them see them that way and of course gardens that sit in the middle as a sort of you know hugely um cultural space that also looks towards towards the natural world so i so i think um i, I mean what to say except that i think all of this resonates very much uh, uh, across those landscapes and there are many histories that, that they are all designed landscapes every single one of them um uh, their cultural landscape escapes and there are many histories of them that haven't been told and, and and a lot of those histories for example are of working people so we have you know we know that primarily the stories have been told of often are stories of of um sort of ownership rather than of working people so um yeah i, I think that's that's important we're, we're doing some lovely work just doing simple things that do things like for example looking at the landscapes that are presented in the historic paintings in some of our houses and what those mean for better understanding how we can care for landscapes today and how we can achieve greater biodiversity in, in our landscapes today. So the, the marvel of the National Trust and the madness of it is sort of the opportunity to, to stitch all of that together. So I, I thought I might just go in a slightly different direction. For the benefit of delegates, we did talk um, in our conversation before today's session about the personal impact of the last 18 months. And I see that there is a question in, in the, uh, the chat about you know some of the more emotional aspects and how how you've individually handled it but also how you've supported staff or in your case Olivet perhaps students so I, I guess it'd, it'd be interesting to hear you reflect a little bit John you talked about you know threats you, you know we know that a lot of the conversations we're having at the minute a lot of the debates we're having a highly charged and very emotional and many of the people on this um, on this call may may feel that as well so Perhaps if I stick with you for now, John, just I'd be interested to know how have you managed to maintain your own mental health and also how have you supported um, colleagues, you know, through a period of quite, um, quite animated uh, debates, let's be frank. Um, I'm so glad you asked that question because so often we separate our personal lives and our professional lives, don't we? And of course, they are they're, they're part of the whole thing, the same, the same thing, really. Um, uh, so it, yeah, it, it, it has it has been it has been very difficult, and um, I, I was I was in a meeting with I sit on the exec of the National Trust. I was in a meeting with my colleagues just last week. It's the first time we got together um, face to face like that in quite that way in a, in a long time, and and there was a lot of emotion in the room. And what I saw was just sort of how great the toll had been on on my colleagues as as well as myself, and um, and that does go across the organization so i think just to acknowledge that i mean I, I i've changed the way i i've changed the way i i live actually if i'm honest over the last year so i am um i i, I just very simple things i walk and i run every single day or walk or run every single day i never thought i'd say that and it's but it has been the the greatest single change in my life and it is it, it has been an absolutely wonderful thing it's time to reflect and you know time to be in nature and all, all, all sorts of things so you know i i think there are some very practical things there um, there is there is a wonder in this new world we you know these machines that we're on at the moment can tie us down to our desks but they can all also free us up and um, I, I, I think Jeff somebody like you at leading a major organization you know I think the challenge is to of course we want to bring our teams together but actually just to have that flexibility to free people up to to live lives that are balanced ones to see their families to do all of the things that that mean that when they do have chat professional challenges whatever they are and even if they're you know sort of more more um i don't know smaller ones or more or more immediate ones or something i think i think our job as as leaders is to support our teams in their whole lives um yeah. and uh, I, I know my my boss who leads the national trust that's that's very much her view and that has helped me throughout and what about you Oliver? is that balance important for you and, and do you find that with your students are, you, are they able to kind of strike that balance at the moment uh, it was very hard for them, for, for everybody, but for young people, it was incredibly hard. And I'm, I'm talking about, you know, dramatic, dramatic things, you know, um, 
suicide, um, self-harm and, and, and things like that. So there were several layers of help and support that was needed. At my level, it was about constant dialogue and um, I'm the queen of Zoom now. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> we talked, we talked, we talked. So there's the academic relationship and the talk about, you know, the object, the, the, the memory, the history and all that and how it's relevant to their daily lives relevant to what they care for. But also at another level for my two T's, it was about understanding how they can actually uh, come stronger from, from, from this. Being isolated means that you have opportunities to do things that you never learn. So I know it sounds trivial, but learning to, to sing, um, learning to, you know, all these stuff that are really helpful to take your mind off things. And it's also, how do you engage with certain things that you, when you don't have access? Okay, so online exhibitions was a major one. Um, and, and, and discovering the links between the cultural sector and history through those online exhibition actually transform the way they understand in a very academic way, they understand what history is about. So it, it was actually very useful to have this conversation. So I, it's interesting that both of you are kind of reflecting on some of the, uh, the more positive aspects as well of the last 18 months of the pandemic. I know, John, you said earlier on that you thought in, in many respects, it's re many respects National Trust was in a stronger position. I, I wonder whether you just want to explore that a little bit further um, you know, it, in what way are you in this in a stronger position, and how do you think that's going to um, shape the future of the organisation? And and you know, again, just sticking on this theme of how people are feeling and how people are looking after themselves. You know, what do you see as the positive benefits coming out of that? Um, I, I mean, just you know, just starting on a very practical level, um, we we have a, we have a smaller cost base. I'm sorry to introduce something as sort of basic as that but that um that that means we can be more agile as an organization we can um uh i don't know we we, we can be more fo focused in what we're doing um, I, I think we have been forced very hard to prioritize and it's doing things is easy not doing things is incredibly difficult you try saying to your teams like what are you not going to do next year i promise you the list will be you know <laughs> non-existent i i i am um, I tried in our we, we have an annual planning round as lots of organizations do i tried to do, introduce an anti-plan this year which was to to plan all the things we wouldn't do well you know it it, it was virtually non-existent again but um on the whole we have we have sort of prioritized and prioritized and focused and come back to the things that are the most important to us because actually we we, we have we have less resource so um I, I think i think there's that but i think undoubtedly we are braver as an organization because we could either you know put our heads down and fall over or something or, or we could get brave and get on with it so I, I i think we're more courageous as individuals and um and more courageous as an organization and i think i think um i think we've, we're thicker skinned and and that doesn't mean we're insensitive that would be the wrong thing but i think we're thicker skinned and you know the first time i the, the first article i read in whatever uh, national newspaper i'm not gonna i'm not gonna bother to name them um i it, it 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 hurt and so did the second and so did the third and so did the 50th and so did the 60th the 300th maybe hurts less and the the 400 will hurt less than that so you know <laughs> in a very in a very practical sense i i just think we are more determined that's what we are we're more determined to get on with doing what we see as our as our core work which is caring for the places we look after being for everyone and 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 um supporting other people to tell the whole history of the places we care for yeah and, and, and Oliver do you feel the same do you feel more determined I mean obviously you know you have a, a, a very deep involvement in Bristol and and what's happening there in terms of moving the conversation forward do you feel do you feel that echoes for you Yes, I mean, I was hired in Bristol to look at the links that the university has with slavery. So there's another conversation that's going on and the involvement is uh, very much, it's, it's very deep. Another conversation is about the renaming uh, of those buildings. So a lot is happening and it's, it's very dynamic. And, and what is interesting for me to observe is really the regional differences, you know, in terms of England having a conversation of should we took black teach black history or maybe not, maybe yes. And, and in Wales where I'm actually based and I live, um, already had this conversation, already had the audit and working towards a cur curriculum uh, at the regional level. And, it, it, and for me, it's fascinating to observe how you rewrite history by, by 
um, by taking the measure, the measurement of society and societal debates. Yeah, and there's a question from one of the audience there about deaccessioning records and decolonizing catalogues. Do you have any concerns, you know, as a historian, about whether what that means in terms of barriers to access for researching, particularly around slavery and colonialism? What do you mean? Uh, um, what kind of barriers? I'm not sure. Well, I, I suppose, you know, I, I think the, the question is basically asking that, um, you know, as as um, as institutions start to reconsider the, the challenging nature of their collections and change the way that they describe them and change, you know, um, change, you know, think about whether who should own some of those collections. Do you think that that's going to in any way inhibit research? No, not at all. Um, that we are having these conversations now because the, fit pic the full picture hasn't been presented. We, we, we haven't done our, our job as well, um, scholars or historians or perhaps practitioners by presenting a fuller picture so that people, I, I keep saying this over and over, I feel like a broken record, but we can't change history. We can present it and we can be brave enough to present the good, the bad, the ugly. But because we haven't done that, this is why we're having these conversations over and over. As to what the impact on the object is, we need to expose these objects. We need to, to bring them out and actually talk about what it, what it meant and why they have been hidden, but also what, what happened and therefore teach that, that, that history. So I'm, I'm full, full disclosure, really. Okay. Uh, perhaps two last questions then before we have to, to wind things up. Uh, one from the audience and then one from me, maybe. So, um, uh, this is pitched, I don't know if you've seen it, as a provocative question, but this concept of culture wars, um, you know, do you think that this is a real thing? And, and what direction do you think it's going to lead institutions like the National Trust, not just the National Trust, but, you know, um, institutions like, our, like National Archives as well, and the university sector over the coming years? Uh, me or, or John? Uh, oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, Oliver, we'll stick with you and then we'll go to John. Okay. I'm amused by that. We had the clash of civilization. Now we have the cultural wars and that we have, there's another one, I've forgotten. Anyway, there are a few of them. What it actually means is who gets to talk about culture? What is culture? What does culture mean? Several definitions and it depends on the context, the place and so on and so forth. So by saying cultural war, there's this implication that there's one culture that determines what a culture is. And I, I find that quite amusing because we are beating around the bush and therefore not tackling the main question, which is what history is this? Whose history is this? How do we tell those stories? And until we've done that, we keep going about all these phrases that are for me a bit pointless, really. John. Yeah, I, I, I think it's an artificial construct. I think it's really unhelpful. And I, I don't think we're part of a cultural war. And I think actually we need to determinedly not be part of a cult, cultural war. Um, and I, I think it's only in, in the interest of a, of a very few people to have something that's called a cultural war. Um, it's interesting, We uh, at, at coming out of that um, report, we consulted about 3,000 people from um, people of color, people with lived experience, um, academics, um, uh, volunteers, our members uh, and, and staff and so on about what they felt about the report and about next steps and there, there were there were so many different views such sort of so much disagreement and yet absolute consensus that in the end everybody agreed that our role as the National Trust was to to tell the whole history of our, our places or support other people in in doing that so um, I think we can make actually too too much of the difference probably and 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 my proof of that would be that if you go to one of our um, properties and you know million millions of visits every every month um, th this is not I'm, I'm afraid to tell you this is not what people are talking about um, it, it doesn't it doesn't mean they don't want to be part of a conversation but actually it's, it, it, it's not what's fun to their mind and what's fun to their mind is, is, is to have access to a beautiful, interesting place, a place where they can spend time with the people that they care for, as pl a place where they can they, they can feel better and understand a little bit more, more about themselves. But actually, um, they, they don't feel they're part of a, any sort of a war, and the vast majority of our members don't either. So I think that's worth just bearing in mind that this is a this this very polarized conversation is 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 quite a small one to be honest and it feels as though it's the whole um, a society it's not if it, it even feels that it's the whole of our sectors it's not having this conversation so we should be realistic about that 
I think we're, we're pretty much out of time. Any last minute thoughts from either of you on, on, I think we've tried our best there today to try and span the gap between philosophical and practical, but any views that you want to impart as a kind of, as a, a, as a departing note? John, perhaps start with yourself. Yeah, my, thank you. My, my, my last one, I, I am a very practical person. You might have sense that. And I'm, I think there was a question, which is, you know, I, I can't quite remember what it was, but something about what's, you know, what is the opportunity for us to, to come together on this? And I have to be honest, I, I don't know the answer to that. I wish I did because I, I'd sort of tell you and then it would happen. And I, I, I'm a bit frustrated that there isn't more opportunity for us to come together. I, I do think it's not, a, it's not by being part of a cultural war. It's not by trying to oppose something, if I'm honest. It, it's almost the opposite is by proactively and deliberately demonstrating history as a unifying force and how to do history well uh, and widely and democratically um, but I think it's a bit more than doing that individually as organizations so if any of you I'm on Twitter if anybody has any ideas if anybody wants to wants to work with me on that I'd be very pleased to hear from you okay thanks John Olivet any final remarks from yourself um yeah my my the final um remark would be be brave be brave and you know learning about histories that are disturbing are not don't um, take anything away from you they enrich you they challenge you but they enrich you and ultimately we, we're all stuck on this earth so we need to make it work so they just learn more and more about other people and, and that that's the beauty of it